ad adulto Ma oggi ti guardo e ti chiedo Vuoi ballare con me? Welcome to Unlearn Roundtable Discussion Series Episode 1. This is Zoe and I'm here to introduce a very juicy panel where knowledge, expertise, but mostly embodiment of a heritage unravels possibly more than one identity. We have Silvana Patriarca, professor of history here in New York at Fordham University. She specializes in the history of modern Italy and in particular in the culture history of nationalism and the construction of national identities. Crystal Trotter on Zoom, based in North Carolina, founder of Accento World, creative designer, writer, and image activist, daughter of Italian mother and African-American father. And Steven Cerulli, a multi-generational Italian-American He is a PhD candidate in modern history at Fordham University and a researcher at the Calandra Italian American Institute, Queens College. He specializes in Italian American diaspora studies. I am a multimedia artist. I was born and raised in Italy and moved in Brooklyn, specifically Bushwick by accident, in the middle of a huge economical recession. The first black president of USA was elected. It was 2008. I am an opinionated daughter of two Italians, working class parents with sharecroppers, grandparents. I grew up in central Italy, not around an environment full of art, books or records, but beside many powerful women and radical people involved in political movements who self-educated themselves and who firmly believed in the necessity of a systemic, profound change. Many of us, still struggle to feel accepted in their birthplaces, no matter the passport, the language, no matter how we choose to identify ourselves. What we need to change in order to see a more inclusive sense of nation, a lot. We are here because identity is sacred. Identity as the origins, where we come from, who was walking down this path before us and what they were about but mostly where we belong and stand. As New Yorkers would say, don't front. It is an urge we all have, which often, when it's found, creates closure as strong as a sense of home. The DNA tests at a success to an extent, but in reality, there's so much to do in order to embrace this data, create a true sense of belonging and towards real integration and equality. Italians are and were always the result of a very intricate blend of ethnicities and by latest scientific researches. In Europe, Italians have the highest genetic diversity. The gradient of their genetic variability scattered all over the peninsula encloses on a small scale the old genetic variants between Southern and Continental Europeans. This amazing diversity started to accumulate soon after the late glacial maximum, which ended approximately 19,000 years ago. Have they always been embracing this diversity about themselves and welcomed others? Silvana. Well, um, as a historian of the modern period, I would say that uh, a lot depends on uh, the creation of the modern nation and a certain way of creating that nation, which is based on the idea that there is specific people with its own culture, with its own history, uh, and also with its own uh, sort of somatic characteristics, uh, right? a construction that uh, uh, was started more or less at the end of the 18th century, early 19th century, and so that created this idea of, uh, you know, a distinct people, um, and fairly homogeneous in spite of, right, uh, dif internal differences, but there was an idea that became uh, dominant eventually in the modern era, right, that there was also a certain homogeneity. But this is actually in contrast to the actual history of the long-term history of the country, 
uh, which was uh, in fact uh, not homogeneous at all. It was uh, a mixture of uh, many different uh, peoples, ethnicities, and so on, that had moved into the peninsula over a long period of time. So, so it was very, very diverse throughout its history, and it's still very diverse. But the question is, what kind of construction right, the nationalists, the Italian national patriots in the 19th century and then later, right, if we think also about the aggressive nationalism of the fascists and so on, have created in the minds of many Italians uh, that you can still see today, right, this kind of idea of uh, uh, a pretty, um, you know, u again, unique civilization or unique people. And so this makes very diff uh, difficult now accepting the change that has been taking place uh, now for quite a while, meaning a, a big influx uh, of people from non-European countries, because we have to think about the history of the Italian people in the 20th century, which was a, in the late 19th century, was a history of emigration, right, of Italians leaving and going to other countries in large numbers, in millions. Right, uh, so um, this is a very important component of the of the history of of the mod of modern Italy, uh, and Italians uh, uh, seem to be reluctant to accept the fact that things are changing, uh, and that now there has been this big influx since the um, starting in the late seventies and so on of people from non-European countries, and this has created tension, and has created, of course. Uh, a fodder for this kind of uh, movements, which are very sort of strongly anti-immigration, which are now in power. Um, so, so you see, uh, the the answer is complex because the history is complex, uh, and I would say that uh, Italians have to um, really elaborate, uh, uh, elaborate, and um, face this kind of new stage in their history, which doesn't mean they are not. Uh, at the same time also emigrating themselves, because there are a large number of young people uh, in the past uh, 10, 15, or f even 20 years who have been leaving Italy. So it's not that Italy has just simply been receiving people, you know, a large influx from abroad, but it's also continuing this uh, historical trend of leaving the country, looking for better opportunities. Uh, so it's still there. I mean, it's not, it's not gone away. And it's really sort of part of um, yeah, who, the, who Italians are, are people on the move, right? And they should sort of recognize the right to move, <laughs> right? And to move in to other peoples too, because that's part of their country. But this is not something that sort of works uh, uh, simply, right? This kind of acceptance. Uh, uh, right now, certainly, it's not a phase uh, in which there is that kind of acceptance of diversity. But if we go back to the past, again, to the ancient past, uh, uh, to uh, the Roman past, and we think about uh, the policy of assimilation, so that uh, an extension of citizenship that the Roman had in their you know, conquest of, uh, of Italy and then the Mediterranean, we see, you know, lots of different people's communities living together, maybe not always uh, without tensions, uh, but as a matter of fact, uh, being able, right, to live together. So we have to sort of think about different models of communities that existed in the past uh, that can actually be recreated, uh, right, again in, uh, you know, new ways uh, in the future. So we should not have a static idea of community, because historically communities have been created in different ways, and we should have uh, enough imagination, right, to imagine again new foundations for for communities, right, of peoples, right, and go beyond this idea that is a very recent creation of the nation, right, the nation as something uh, different, uh, unique, uh, culturally sort of stable, uh, right, <laughs> and static also, right? We should not think about cultures in this kind of static way. So we have a lot to learn from history. And, you know, we have to be able to go beyond the mythologies of the nation, mm -hmm. right? Because we have this kind of myths of, uh, of nations which are really uh, fairly recent creation, 19th century, 20th century creations. Um,
give you some, you, you can also find maybe some <laughs> origins a bit earlier, depending on, on which countries you consider. But the big, you know, period of uh, in which myths of nations of the origins were elaborated is the 19th century. In the ca Italian case, of course, is the period of the resurgiment. Uh, um, Crystal. Well, um, I think that was beautiful. I think that one of the key words here was imagination um, to create community. I think that's that's what kind of stuck with me the most um, as Silana was talking. And I think that there's a huge lack of imagination right now. I just feel that, uh, you know, when you talk about Italy and Italians, um, it's there there's a lack of imagination and you can see what lack of imagination brings which is could be very dangerous um i do when you're talking about like to answer your question about embracing diversity i think embrace is a big word i think um we're at the level of acceptance um and from my experience um living in italy and um, I've never witnessed people embracing diversity. Um, I, I've, within, you know, Italians kind of tend to accept diversity when it's in their inner circles, really. So they know the person, they know who they are, they know their family, right? Um, but when you, um, when it, when you have to deal with diversity in terms of another person that may look like me, but is not me, um, then that's a different conversation. Um, it, you know, I remember growing up, people would call me, I would just be Crystal. I was, you know, Kika or Krista, right? And that's me. That that kind of defined who I was. And um, there's a form of acceptance there, but then that was it, right? They, re they really didn't know me, really. They knew me, but, but they didn't know me. They didn't accept my um, diversity fully. Right, they couldn't understand, or they didn't venture out to understand what um, the difficulties of systemic racism, or or anything like. And, and that's too. We're talking about racism, but even just to know what I like, right? And I kind of fit into their mold or their perception of who I was, which was Kika, right? That's Crystal. That's it. There's nothing more, or nothing less than what we want you to be. And this was friends and family. So I think it's a form of acceptance. Um, I don't, we're not at a level of embracing diversity at, by any means. Um, and then I think that growing up in the North um, and having talked to and or having spoken to people who live in the Southern Italy, um, I do have a sense of, if we have to talk about accepting diversity, embracing diversity, that there's more acceptance in, the, in Southern Italy than there is in Northern Italy. Um, I have that kind of feeling, um, but yeah, uh, yeah. I think I think there's a lack of imagination, and we we need to do something. We need to be creative in order to create community because um, there is no there's no embracing anything at the moment. I think that it's getting to a point where we're actually going backwards, where we're not um, we're not we're not even accepting Italians within Italians, right? It's it's just, it's really going backwards. Um, so let alone having people of diverse backgrounds. Um, and yeah, I think that um, there's another point I wanted to, to touch on, but um, when you were asking about embracing diversity, the first thing that came to mind was regionality. And that was as far as like people, you know, Italians um, embrace their own originality. So it's it's always who I know, who who I am, right? And it's like the other regions is not um, considered. So there's always the sense of competition. There's always there's um, always the sense of I'm better than you, or you know, or you do this differently than I do. So, um, and I, I wonder if that is cultural because there is a tendency to 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 compare ourselves to others but then again everyone should be like us within the italian culture so it's very difficult to embrace anything really um so yeah 
Stephen. So I'm furiously typing away on some notes. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm going to pivot off a couple of things that we've discussed already. Um, in terms of the kind of multicultural history of Italy, I, I'm fully from what was once the Kingdom of Two Sicilies, but from four or five different uh, current Italian states. Um, in the medieval period, under the Hohenstaufens, I'm, not, I'm totally mispronouncing that, but they were called like the Swabian monarchies. The Kingdom of Sicilies, which was to the Kingdom of Sicily, just Sicily plural, uh, singular, was a multicultural place. Um, if you went to the court of Frederick II, you would have Arabs, Jewish, um, people who were Norman, Swabians from Germany. You'd have people from Italy, Sicilians who spoke, you know, Neo Latin Sicilian, Sicilians who spoke Agalo. Neo Latin, which is closer to Piedmontese, a Lombard, right? In um, the various different types of Neapolitan peoples, whether they be Calabres, Abruzzese, so there is this kind of historical precedence, right? And we should we can also think of of Tuscany, right? I'm thinking through the years, right? In uh, 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 Cosimo de Medici, I think the second or third was like the first person of color head of state in Europe, right? This gives you an idea of that kind of racial inferiority, etc., um, comes along later, even in Italy today. Uh, the kind of historic languages dispersed throughout the geography are actually quite diverse, right? The village where I'm from in Puglia, we speak a Franco-Provencal dialect, right? Because our ancestors came from southern France in the 1300s. The village next to us speaks Arbresh, right? You go about 20 kilometers up, you're going to be in Molais, and they're going to be speaking Croat, uh, Croat, right? So there is this kind of historical precedence of like multiculturalism, especially in the Italian South. But then you can likewise go to the north, right? Go to Piedmont you'll have the peripheries of some areas speaking Occitan dialects. When you go closer to uh, Switzerland, they'll be speaking Artipitan, Franco-Provencal dialects. Um, you go to a place like the Veneto, you'll have transition zones between Venetian and Lombard, right? You'll have Chimbrians who are speaking a Bavarian German language, right? And, and I just found out Crystal was, is from Friuli, right? That's a whole other different set of languages, right? Reto Romance languages. So there is this um, already existing uh, diversity within Italy that's always been kind of tolerated um, throughout its history. Um, to Silvana's point about uh, Italy being people on the move, there's a really good book called Italy's Many Diasporas by Donna Gabaccia, and it basically talks about Italian history and Italians being a people who have always went from one place to another, right? And a lot of Italians forget this twofold, right? The internal diasporas that took place like a great example you can use my family history is like my great 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 grandparents left Palermo to go to Campania right and then they left uh, Campania to go to America and then they could have stayed there uh, America but then my great grandmother born in America but went back to Italy and grew up there then came back over here right and if you go to any of these little villages even in, in the north right the Veneto saw the first migration waves in the 1850s you'll find people who will tell stories you know mostly the older people who can remember this of the grand grandparents that went to Argentina, that went to Brazil, that went to the United States, right? And the uh, Italian-American historian Rudolf Veckley argues that about 51% of the people that came over during the Great Diaspora between 1880 and 1924, when the borders were closed, specifically on Italians, went back to Italy, right? And would become small-scale farmers, shopkeepers, whatever, because they were able to get some economic capital in the United States that they did not have ac access to in Italy. Um, which we can go over the whole other reason because of how unification went, right? That's a whole other topic within itself, right? Unification went a particular way because of the people who led it, right? There could have been a more multicultural unification or accepting of regional identities and non-colonial uh, projects through a kind of federalist resurgimento through people like Carlo Piscani, um, Giuseppe Ferrai in, in Milan. Piscani was from the Kingdom of Two Sicilies, right? So a lot of this stuff is also, uh, this stuff, I mean, problematic, prob problem, uh, problematic uh, positions towards race, towards diversity, etc., are also the conclusions of historical choices made at certain periods of time to choose to build a nation that's like this, right? To choose to build a society that's like this. Um, so I think that's extremely important to talk about. And as we go on more, uh, more I'm more than happy to um, talk a little bit more about the diasporic experience, right? And the kind of racialization that happens with Italians in the diaspora. Um. Yeah, I, I actually, um, since like uh, everybody's kind of bringing uh, that up, the fact of uh, already an internal uh, division and differences in, in Italy, there has been always this uh, hate between north and mm. south. And uh, 
Sicilians and Napolitans seems to be uh, the majority of the immigrants that moved specifically, I would say, New York City. Um, and to me, this is pretty in interesting also the fact that um, what they've been bringing with them is also uh, fascism. Like if I um, walk around uh, the Bronx or Little Italy, there are several Little Italy in, in New York. And mm, many of these uh, store owners, they might have the uh, the head of Mussolini or they have something like a symbol that, uh, of course, uh, recall fascism, and which is... Uh, pretty weird because at the same time uh, Sicilians as being treated uh, and Napolitans I would say the South in general differently because of um, the way they speak they, the, the, the food that they eat whatever but it seems to be also that the Southern Italians have been uh, darker skin and even in the slur uh, Terrone um, which means earthy, basically. Mm -hmm. um, uh, reading uh, seems to be uh, related to the, the color of the skin. It's not only, oh, they are farm, uh, farm people. Um, <laughs> but no matter that, so no matter Sicilians and Napolitans, Southern Italians have been um, uh, discriminated, uh, that's what also they brought with them while, you know, moving to other countries um and yeah even like here in new york i've been uh sometime uh in some conversations and people were asking me specifically if i was sicilian mm -hmm. um i would say that in general um also uh mine i've been navigating um uh, uh the black culture a lot because i'm a, a hip-hop fan um and Black people have been asking me, are you Sicilian? Because they, they feel um, connected more with the Sicilians. Like, oh, be, and I've heard like also people telling me, oh, Sicilians are not necessarily uh, white. I wanted to pick up on uh, what um, Crystal was mentioning about region, this regionalism, right? Uh, in, uh, in terms of, right, something that has been produced by the creation of the nation state, mm -hmm. uh, right? That, that did not exist necessarily before, right? When Italy was divided into many states, but then it became uh, exacerbated by the attempt on the part of the Northern elites who were leading the process of unification to impose a certain model yep. of, uh, you know, of, of Italianness, uh, really, and also of, uh, in a certain idea of the nation in which it was the North that was the more developed, the more uh, uh, right, civilized area, and the South started to be seen as, an, as a region of, uh, as a problem, essentially, within the nation, right? And so, and then it was also racialized, right? Uh, they were sort of, uh, the um, population of Italy at a certain point was divided by anthropologists into the nor into this Nordic uh, sort of Aryan race in the north, and then this kind of Mediterranean, uh, uh, you know, cum African, uh, or, you know, um, components in the south, and was... Uh, um, denigrated, right? The southern population was denigrated, and of course the fact that it was poorer, because there is always a class component that is articulated also with racialization, it was poorer, and thus it was, uh, right, not as uh, on, on top as the rest of the country. And this is a process that we can see also, you know, reiterated this kind of denigration of the southerners when many southerners migrated from the south to the north, right, after World War II. And then, uh, you know, at a certain point, uh, um, this kind of anti-Southern sentiment uh, becomes politicized uh, when the Northern League uh, was created, right? This uh, autonomous leagues uh, in the 1980s. And so these have been feeding, right, uh, this kind of ideas about, again, about uh, uh, somehow essential difference, uh, racial difference, again, which then had been uh, also used against uh, uh, people from outside of Italy, right? So it's, it's a good ground, let's say, this kind of anti-Southern uh, uh, racism in a part of Italy that sort of uh, uh, on which the other type of racism can be sort of grafted upon or sort of fed by also, right? I mean, if you're not able to accept people from your own country, 
right? If you're still, um, you know, um, making them into something else, it's much easier than making all sorts of other people into people that you do not accept, right? That you do not want to recognize as uh, fully human, as fully having their own sort of uh, uh, ideas, cultures that you should just uh, learn from instead of just rejecting uh, and so on. So, so let's say that this kind of internal racism has also you know, helped developing uh, these uh, other uh, types of racism. Um, or, you know, it's, it's, it's certainly not helped uh, in, 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 you know, accepting, accepting difference because already there was this kind of non-acceptance of the internal uh, difference or what was constructed as the, this kind of internal difference. Um, so, um, and then are you totally right that there is, uh, right, what we see today certainly uh, doesn't make us uh, think that there is, uh, you know, a big effort on the part of uh, institution to create a culture of acceptance, uh, right, to, to create that kind of culture. Because without that, without this kind of also action from above, uh, I don't think that we go very far. I mean, because the population is, you know, clearly not everybody is uh, fearful of change. Uh, there are people who are sort of more willing to accept, but there has to be also an intervention right, by institutions, uh, right, in the education system, and so on. And, and I see very little of that, I have to say, very, very little of that. In all these years uh, in which, uh, right, uh, certainly when the right is in power, they are not going in that direction. And now what is even more worrisome is they have started to talk openly about ethnic, uh, about uh, the need to stop et so-called ethnic replacement, ethnic substitution, which is uh, a canard, which is a conspiracy theory, right? The theory of the great uh, replacement. Uh, and there are politicians in power now who, spoke, who speak explicitly about that. So we have to sort of be quite worried about that because uh, of course we have seen uh, you know, ep episodes of blatant racism and this kind of systemic racism that exist before, but when they are in power, they are really quite, uh, quite dangerous because they, uh, they let, uh, you know, everybody essentially talk also um, a language of hatred. Uh, I don't know if you followed in this, these past days uh, the story of this general, right, uh, who comes up with this book, uh, which is homophobic and racist, openly as a right to, to give a full legitimacy right to this kind of discourse uh, so so this is what is uh, particularly worrisome in, in in this moment but there is of course uh, at this point we have years and uh, decades right in which these kind of parties have been in power and they have been modeling right uh, uh, this kind of rejection of difference uh, right modeling a kind of uh, uh, white supremacy, frankly, right? I mean, or the supremacy of the so-called indigenous population, which, uh, again, they're sort of creative because uh, who is, uh, who is, there are no real uh, autochthonous <laughs> Italian in the sense that everybody's sort of descending from people who have been moving into the country, right? But there is this kind of distinction being made. Um, and so, yeah, so we, we have, a, I would say there is a, a lot of um, need for more histories, you know, <laughs> in uh, uh, for studying more history at, at this point, which is not uh, not particularly uh, well done, as I understand in Italian. I teach here, but uh, from my friends in Italy and from what I know about the Italian school system, no, there is not much uh, much history of this kind of issues. Also, right, a sort of a critical history of the Italian past, the more knowledge of colonialism, for example, of Italian colonialism, which is barely, you know, not much studied in Italian school as far as I know, right? And so knowledge of sort of Italians as oppressors of other people, right? Which is also necessary to have this kind of critical self-understanding of, uh, of, the, of the, the culture. Yeah, um, I'm like Steve, I'm taking notes, but I'm analog here. I'm taking notes on my so pen and paper. Um, but again, I think that um, 
it's still this lack of imagination. I kind of want to, I kind of want to refer back to that because when thinking about what happened with the general um, and just this, this phrase, the statement where he was talking about this uh, volleyball player for the Italian national team, if I'm not mistaken, the uh, Afro Italian volleyball player. And he said, she's Italian. So it got to a point, it did get to a point where he couldn't deny her Italianness because the way she spoke, the way she acted and everything was so Italian that he couldn't deny that, which I found interesting. But then there was all, there's, there was still this excuse to say she's Italian, but she doesn't have the features of an Italian. So there's always something that's not going to be, it's never going to be good enough, right? And we, I, I feel like... Um, we know what that looks like when you're trying to please somebody that doesn't really want you, you're never going to be good enough anyway, no matter what you do. Um, And so I was thinking about the lack of imagination of these institutions and the fact that the schools don't um, teach, you know, history the way they should. And, and the lack of imagination is very important to point out because when we have these politicians that clearly have an agenda and they they reference back to history and to fascism to 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 buy and they they kind of have their playbook kind of they know what to do the lack of imagination i think is are the other institutions and politicians that really don't know how to stop them because when you have a statement like that when someone says she's italian but she doesn't have the features the lack of imaginations means that the opposite party kind of believes that too. And so they don't know what to do, right? And so I also find it interesting that we have difficulties accepting Afro-Italians and Italians of color, but at this, and in the same breath, we can say African-Americans are American, right? And it, it's, pretty, it's pretty easy to point out. It seems easy to point out, but in reality, it just seems... Um, I think for this lack of context, I feel like the lack of imaginations mean that we live in this world and we grew up in this world with these rules and these, um, uh, you know, the racism that exists. Um, some people learned it, internalized it. It's really, you just, this is the way the world is, right? Society is. And so you don't know how to, so you grew up in a world where um, African Americans are Americans and you just accept that. Right. And so this lack of imaginations means that no one no one can kind of get out of their comfort zone to be like, wait a second, this is logical to me. This person is Italian. And so I do think that um, especially with the project I'm doing, it just really helped me understand that we have to work. The only way forward really is to work towards a world we want to live in. And so we kind of have to create this world and build this world uh, and be imaginative to make this happen because it's not um, um, it's not presented to us the way the world actually should be. Uh, another thing that uh, it was interesting, I didn't know the the thing about um, the Mussolini kind of you know statues uh, that Zoe was talking about here in the United States, um, but I did learn about interesting enough, I learned about Southern Italians when I moved to the United States. I knew nothing about Southern Italy, really, because nothing. I I lived in Friuli until I was 25, and I never even thought about Southern Italy um, because I didn't know anyone from Southern Italy. It just, you know, and the internet isn't the way it is now, which is kind of, but I do wonder, um, again, living in this bubble, and living in a context where that's just the way it is, it was really hard actually to even think that I could maybe meet a Southern Italian just to know them, you know, and just to um, understand, see if we had anything in common really. So that, the fact that, and even when we talk about race and we talk about, it would be very difficult, for example, to explain race to Italians in Italy and even say, you know, trying to explain to them this concept of, well, you know, there's this thing that in, you know, if you go to the U.S., they don't consider you white, right? Um, or there's this thing where they say you're you're white, or I thought you were Italian, not white. So this whole confusing kind of dynamic where there's a lot to unpack. 
But if an Italian person got out of that context of Italy and left with a clear head, and you kind of have this overview and you look at Italy, but from afar, it, it helps to kind of breathe and take in information um, and, and, and try to, if someone is inclined to do this, to kind of come up with a solution. But in Italy, it's really hard. And sometimes I think the lack of imagination might be a, by design, you know, the fact that no one can really um, take a moment to breathe and think because it's so chaotic. And um, so, yeah, I, and it's really hard for people to step out of this this perception, the way, you know, everyone is perceived and how the way everyone should be. Um, I remember when I moved here, um, I remember moving here, the way I grew up and the way I saw things is if you are an artist, that's all you are, for example, right? If you study finance, that's what you're going to be forever, right? You do finance, like that's that's your thing. You can't, but if you tell someone that they're, they're an artist or they do finance and then all of a sudden they're going to become a writer, that's that's not the order of things in Italy. But if you come to the US, that's actually a possibility. And it gives you this freedom to be able to be who you are whenever you're ready to be who you are. Um, and so when I moved here, I remember there was a cleaning lady um, in uh, one of uh, my friend's house. She was a cleaning lady. And I uh, I started working as the first time. When I moved here, I, I worked in a restaurant for a year, in an Italian restaurant, because I thought it would be easy. And it was not, because <laughs> it was not easy. Uh, I did not know what Italian American food was. So that was another experience. Um, but when I met this woman and she said, oh, that's interesting. So you work at that restaurant. Um, I work there too. And the first thing that popped in my head was, oh, she's the cleaning lady in that restaurant. But in reality, she was also a waitress. So she did, you know, different jobs and it was normal. Whereas that's not what I grew up with. That wasn't, that wasn't normal. You were one thing. And when you grow up thinking that you're just one thing, it's kind of hard, especially psychologically, it's hard to get out of that that box that was created for you. Yeah, so I wanna go through my list of things. Um, to your point about fascism, it was always contested here, right? And it was never a majority of the population that was fascist. Um, some really good primary source and also somewhat secondary source, and this is the works of uh, Gaetano Salvemini, right, in the 1940s, kind of estimating fascism's influence on the Italian-American population. Generally speaking, it tended to be more popular with the mercantile classes and the wealthy elites, um, and Arthur Avenue, in your example, was one of the main uh, mercant, it still is today, uh, mercantile districts of the Italian-American community. Um, so that might, that kind of class component might explain uh, why there is a strong, uh, or not strong, but still felt uh, fascistic presence there. Um, but there's also places like Bushwick, where you are, which was a hotbed of anarchism, which was if you were fascist and went there, you'd get beat up. Um, <laughs> so there is this kind of very layered history to um, fascism and anti-fascism in the Italian-American experience, right? And there's some reasons why um, non-mercantile Italian-Americans um, would lean towards fascism is the kind of their place in American society as the white uh, lower on the totem pole. And I'll get to that in a little bit, right? Where, uh, you know, though you may be a worker at some factory here in the United States and you're working with uh, potentially African-Americans, um, well, at the end of the day, I'm still Italian, right? And Mussolini shows that we're powerful and that we're strong and I'm kind of part of that, right? So there is this psychological meeting the structural uh, co component to that um, to your point of uh, the crossovers between um, Italian Americans and African Americans, this is a really good book uh, by this scholar out of uh, one of the universities in Vermont, John Janeri, called Flavor and Soul, right? And it looks at the crossovers between African American and Italian Americans, especially in the arts, right? But there's also neighborhood crossovers, right? For example, where my dad grew up in Stanford, Connecticut, the West Side was the Italian and the Black neighborhood, um, the largest little Italy in New York City from 1880 to 1960 was East Harlem, right? Which is always the El Barrio, right? Which was always this kind of multi-ethnic neighborhood. Um, 
So what were Italians in the kind of race hierarchy in America, legally speaking, always white. Um, however, what does this mean? Right. What does this mean? In the 19th century, there's this kind of conception of race in hierarchies. Right. And the world is split up into colors. Right. Which we now call races. Right. And obviously Europeans are doing this. So whites on top, blacks on bottom. Right. And we also have to remember this is also coming off the heels of colonialism. Right. When racial categorization. Right. Even in the Spanish Empire. Right. We think of only like the English as being the most racist Spanish Empire, too. Right. Where during col uh, colonization. Right. We begin to creating of these kind of racial caste. Right. And where you belong in this racial caste system is usually connected where you are in the economic system. Right. And later on, black thinkers such as uh, Cedric uh, Robinson comes up with this concept of racial capitalism. Right. Where capitalism is about exploiting uh, lesser races to build up, um, you know, basically to build up capital. Um, so where do Italians fall in? Well, legally speaking, white, right? But within whiteness, there's another layer of hierarchies, right? With Anglo-Saxons, Germans, Nordic people on top, right? And then like Celtic people in the middle. Then below that's Latins, Italians, Spaniards, Southern French, right? And then below that would be like Arabs who would still be considered white. They'd say Semites, Arabs and Jews, etc. So Italians, though legally white, are still kind of lower in this racial caste system, right? Then on the ground, though, we get these really weird scenarios, right? So, for instance, in Louisiana, this is really famous uh, 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 Jim Crow era lawsuit. I think it's in 1923 or 1915. It's in the 20th century where a Sicilian woman, whose last name is Labude, marries an African-American man, right? At the court is like, you know, you're not allowed. We don't have interracial marriages legal in the South until like 1967 right? Um, Loving versus Virginia. So we have this scenario, right, where this court is trying to decide, right, whether this Sicilian woman is white or not, and they conclude they can't decide or not if she's white or not, right? So we always have these on the ground uh, uh, kind of exceptions, right? And there's this kind of uh, afraidness, uh, for lack of a better word, of ghettoization within the Italian American community to kind of embrace that kind of otherness that's existed in the history. But I do want to emphasize, right, Italians in the, in the American diaspora have always been able to benefit from structural whiteness in the way that, for instance, Chinese Americans, African Americans, indigenous Americans um, have not been able to until, you know, uh, up until this point of history, right? That could change in 100 years or so, right? But up into this um, point of history, right? And to look more into that is a really good book by uh, Jessica. Barbado Jackson called Dixie's Italians. Um, and to Savannah's point about history, right? We use the United States as an example. Uh, the millennial generation, right? My, my generation born between, let's say, 83 and 2000 or 95, whatever it is, right? We came up in an era where the school system started teaching about racial sensitivity. Mm -hmm. So, like, I learned about the civil rights movement in my school uh, and coming up, and I went to very poor schools too, right? I, uh, I you know, I'm from a big city, but now that here or there, um, we learned about civil rights. We learned about racism, right? When my dad was going to high school in the 60s, my mom was going to high school in the 70s. They didn't learn about slavery, right? They didn't problematize things like mm. Columbus. They didn't problematize things like Thanksgiving. That stuff was problematized for me, right? It wasn't like, oh, like, destroy this, destroy that. No, but it was like, hey, like, there's this other aspect, right? And this is a very much a product of the new left, right, in the 1960s and early 1970s to try to bring a greater sensitivity to how we teach history, right? And we did that in this country. And look what's been happening because of that. Um, there's been attacks. Right. And in, in, in this kind of irony as Italian Americans, two Italian Americans are, are leading the kind of charge against uh, the, this shift in how we understand our history. A great example is Christopher Rufo. Right. And then the other one's running for president, Ron DeSantis. Right. They're deliberately dismantling uh, again choices. Right. The choices. Right. right? They're deliberately dismantling, dismantling uh, a more accurate. Uh, a more sensitive and inclusive sense of history, right? You can say that, you know, the United States was built on indigenous genocide, but it also it provided many people opportunities that didn't exist for them in Europe, right? Those two things don't contradict each, just, it contradict each other, right? It exists, right? Some people didn't get those opportunities, but people like my grandparents did. So, you know, just to bring some of this stuff that we discussed together. Do you want to say anything? Yeah, no, I, um, I, I was thinking about uh, th this kind of, um, you know, problematic uh, uh, history of Italians who cannot recognize their own history, who do not know their own history, both here and in Italy, right? Uh, and they are sort of, um, yeah, taking this kind of position that seems to be so... Um, um, so backward, uh, frankly, right? So... Uh, full of fear of uh, resistance resentment and so on right it's um it's sort of sometimes hard to fathom frankly right w why is it that we see so much of that uh, in um 
but uh, but I was thinking again, picking up on um, uh, what Gustav was saying about the lack of imagination. But it's also a lack of language, uh, right? Which is a lack of uh, edu a lack of education, but also a lack of language. Uh, meaning, for example, you know, Italians think that if they do not pronounce the word race, razza they are anti-racist, uh, right? Uh, so uh, I instead, they do not understand that the term, in the English term, has, has resignified, uh, right, the, uh, the original sort of racial hierarchy. It has given a, d a new meaning uh, to, uh, uh, right, to the term itself. Uh, it's been linked uh, to the struggle of African Americans and others, uh, right, against the white supremacy. And so all this kind of language that has been elaborated in uh, the American context and that has been uh, you know, instrumental in the uh, struggle against uh, uh, black oppression and so on does not exist there. And I think it's uh, the new generations, I mean, like you, Crystal, like others, right, you are growing, right, the Afro-Italians who are growing, the sort of non-white Italians who are growing there. Um, you know, will produce something new, but certainly they, you know, uh, it, it will, it certainly will take time. I mean, because right now it looks like, right, this lack of imagination is dominant, uh, uh, the language is not changing. When I present my book on, on the Italian brown babies of World War II, I mean, I see many questions asked exactly about, you know, how should we think about this? Can we actually use the term without reifying race, right, and reifying racial categories? So it's really some kind of basics that seem to be missing still. And you are, I think you are right when you point out that also the opposition is not, uh, um, uh, you know, does not have, seem to have instruments, uh, tools, uh, right, for contrasting uh, the discourse of the right. And the discourse of the right has become hegemonic, uh, right? And, and, and the, uh, the center left of the left is, is really, uh, seem to be very incapable to, um, you know, oppose this kind of tide, uh, right? Uh, and and the, the, um, the, um, also the, all the attacks on, uh, uh, what Italians sort of contemptuously called American political correctness or so on, right, uh, has been really become, uh, you know, accepted, normalized, all that. So, um, yeah, so there is quite a, a, a lot of, uh, of work to do, uh, right? A, and you're totally, you know, I, I take your, your um, point about the fact that here, we uh, do not have any problem thinking about African Americans as Americans, but clearly many Italians do not understand sort of Afro-Italians as full Italians because they have this kind of dominant ethnic conception of the nation. So they have to move, the move to do is to move to a civic conception of the nation, right? Uh, meaning we are part of a whole thing on the basis not of this common culture or somatic features, uh, we are, you know, here because we are, you know, um, at this point part of this community. Uh, we have, uh, you know, we, um, we abide by the laws of this community and we are members of this community. I mean, uh, w what else do you want? Are you going to make a, uh, right, a, a <laughs> uh, an interrogation on, <laughs> on, uh, on each, um, you know, on us uh, as uh, to, to um, verify whether we are really Italians or not. I mean, there should be, right, uh, um, an understanding of the plurality, right? So, so it has to be this kind of idea of a plural society as to, um, to, to develop. And again, this uh, I'm going back to the point that unless the educational system this and the political system has a will to uh, insist on inclusion as opposed to exclusion, we're not going to have much change. I mean, we will have some change that comes, let's say, spontaneously from the fact that, that the society is changing, but spontaneous change will not be enough. I think that without also right, the, this political will, without some kind of action from above to say we cannot continue to think that we are what we were before, whatever it was, we have to think about what we are now and we want what we want to be. And right, what we see is that, right, when the right wins, there is no intention of, 
of, of moving in that direction. The idea is that of the static community and in fact this kind of talk about uh, right, having more ch Italian children, having women making more Italian children. I mean, it's really sort of conveying this kind of, uh, right, old idea uh, of Italianness. And these old ideas, uh, they are pushed mostly uh, by the right wings, right? Mm -hmm. we, we talked about the Santis. Uh, right. I also thought about uh, Bolsonaro, who is another Italian descendant in Brazil. And right. he, he's like, I mean, he talks and in an evil way, which is um, drastic. I would say that that's very recognizable, right? When uh, the right wings in general, they they always been um, very open about how close minded they are and how conservative they are. And uh, I think when uh, when things are so clear, like that you are able to um to decide or or kind of like recognize if you are part of this or not what i think is very ambiguous and i found it to be uh actually uh, very uh not empowering is uh most of the time the conversation they are happening inside the the left world and uh, specifically the italian left world i come from that. I used to go to the squat, was the centro sociale, was the, the place where we all uh, were coming together. And often we could see some diversity there. The conversations are, were very open, but um, we were thinking about United States as, uh, or even the idea of Americans, uh, like, oh, they're stupid straight up <laughs> they're stupid or they, they don't have the knowledge uh their tests at school are just you know crossing uh like checks whatever um when i moved here i actually recognized that here because of uh, a black indigenous people of color radicalism is still in act like there is still a uh, that kind of sense of left that I embrace, that I grew up with, which is not necessarily only classism also, there is the, the race. So um, I feel there is a huge lack of terminology in Italy for these kind of topics. Mm -hmm. Because, for example, when I understood what colorism is, um, among uh, Caribbean people, South American people in particular, but also, yeah, uh, between biracial people here and blacks, I, I felt, wow, this really remind me the these uh, uh, problems that Italy has, which is like the, the hate between North and South. But uh, there is not a translation of colorism at the moment that I know. Uh, intersectionality is a term that uh, was translated uh, from you know the the political movements in America and Audre Lorde and all the black lesbians um, was translated in Italy um, early 90s. So um, what I want to ask is also like how can we um, empower this conversation us that we have been traveling that, that now we have the experience of the two worlds um, and uh, trying to um, enrich this uh, situation where people uh, seems to be colorblind, that even that, another term that people in, in Italy don't even know what it is. It seems that Italians, uh, and I would say maybe, yeah, is generalizing, European in general, but when I have conversations with them, and I'm talking about them, white people, um, they tend, but also actually I have some um, Afro-Italians that are also, um, they believe the same, which is uh, in United States, uh, it seems that everything is uh, a box uh, checking, that the, the race and the racism is something that people enjoy to talk and they are obsessed with. Mm. There is an obsession about race, there is an obsession about, um, uh, you know, words that they are censored. Uh, so censorship in general, and uh, there is not a recognition. Like I, uh, even when you say Americans, you have to do a distinctions between Black Americans, Latin, Latinx, uh, and all that, because 
people tend to say Americans and they refer to white Americans. Mm. So there is not a rec recognition of these groups and their existence. And uh, I think they're bringing s so much to the table in, uh, in a political environment. But I feel that in Italy, uh, there is, I don't know, I feel with internet, we all can see that, we can all hear uh, after George Floyd, you know, um, people should be more open to receive those kind of informations, but there is a, a lot of resistance. Mm -hmm. So what, what can we do?